we're ready for chapter 14 and 15 this time. Ready? Chapter 14 is called Mr. Willy Wonka. Mr. Wonka was standing all alone just inside the open gates of the factory. And what an extraordinary little man he was. He had a black top hat on his head. He wore a tail coat made of beautiful plum colored velvet. His trousers were bottle green. His gloves were pearly gray. And in one hand, he carried a fine gold topped walking cane. So as I always tell you, make a movie in your head while you're reading a story so you can picture the hat and the plum color coat is like a purple and his pants are bottle green, so green color and he had gray gloves on. Covering his chin, there was a small, neat, pointed black beard, a goatee, and his eyes, his eyes were most marvelously bright. They seemed to be sparkling and twinkling at you all the time. The whole face, in fact, was alight with fun and laughter. And oh, how clever he looked, how quick and sharp and full of life. He kept making quick little jerky movements with his head and cocking it this way and that and taking everything in with those bright twinkling eyes. He was like a squirrel in the quickness of his movements, like a quick, clever old squirrel from the park. Suddenly he did a funny little skipping dance in the middle of the snow and he spread his arms wide and he smiled at the five children who were clustered near the gates and he called out, Welcome, my little friends. Welcome to the factory. And there is the picture in the book. His voice was high and fluty. Will you come forward one at a time, please? He called out and bring your parents. Then show me your golden ticket and give me your name. Who's first? The big fat boy stepped up. Oh, Augustus Gloop he said. Augustus, cried Mr. Wonka, seizing his hand and pumping it up and down in a terrific voice, force. My dear boy, how good to see you. How delighted, charmed, overjoyed. Glad you have come with us. Are these your parents? How nice. Come in, come in. That's right. Step through the gates. Mr. Wonka was clearly just as excited as everybody else. My name, said the next child to go forward, is Veruca Salt. My dear Veruca, how now do you do? What a pleasure this is. Do you have an interesting name, don't you? I always thought that a Veruca was sort of a wart that you got on the sole of your feet. I must be wrong, mustn't I? How pretty you look in that lovely mink coat. I'm so glad you could come, dear me. This is going to be such an exciting day. I do hope you enjoy it. I'm sure you will. I know you will. Your father, how are you, Mr. Salt and Mrs. Salt? Overjoyed to see you. Yes, the ticket is quite in order. Please go in. The next two children were Violet Beauregard and Mike TV. They came forward to have their tickets examined and then to have their arms practically pumped off their arm and their shoulder by the Mr. Energetic Mr. Wonka. And last of all, a small nervous voice whispered, Charlie Bucket. Charlie, cried Mr. Wonka. Well, 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 so there you are. You are the one that found your ticket only yesterday, aren't you? Yes, yes, yes. I read all about you in this morning papers. Just in time, my dear boy. I'm so glad. So happy for you. And this, your grandfather, delighted to meet you, overjoyed, enraptured, enchanted. All right, excellent is everybody. And now five children. Yes, good. Now will you please follow me? Our tour is about to begin, but you keep together. Please don't wander off by yourselves. I shouldn't like to lose any of you at this stage of the proceedings. Oh, dear me, no. Charlie glanced back over his shoulder and saw the great iron entrance gates closing behind him. The crowds on the outside were still pushing and shouting. Charlie took the last look at them as the gates closed with a clang. All sight of the outside world disappeared. Here we are, cried Mr. Wonka, trotting along in front of the group. Through this big door, please. That's right, it's nice and warm inside. I have to keep it warm inside the factory because of the workers. My workers are used to extremely hot climate. They can't stand the cold. They would perish if they went outdoors in this weather. They'd likely freeze to death. But who are the workers? said Augustus Gloop. 
All in good time, my dear boy, said Mr. Wonka, smiling at Augustus. Be patient. You shall see everything as we go along. Are all of you inside? Good. Would you mind closing the door? Thank you. Charlie Bucket found himself standing in a long corridor stretched away, away in front of him. As far as he could see, the corridor was so wide that a car could have easily been driven, been driven along it. The walls were pale pink and the lighting was soft and pleasant. How lovely and warm, whis uh, whispered Charlie. I know, and what a marvelous smell, answered Grandpa Joe, taking a long, deep sniff. All the most wonderful smells in the world seem to be mixed up in the air around them. Smelling of roasting coffee and burnt sugar and melting chocolate and mint and violets and crushed hazelnuts and apple blossom and caramel and lemon peel. Hmm. And far away in the distance, far from the heart of the great factory, came a muffled roar of energy as though some monstrous gigantic machine were spinning its wheels at breakneck speed. Now this, my dear children, said Mr. Wonka, raising his voice above the noise, this is the main corridor. Will you please hang your coats and hang hats above those pegs over there and then follow me. That's the way. Good. Everybody ready. Come on then. Here we go. He trotted off rapidly down the corridor with the trails of his plum-colored velvet coat flapping behind him, and the visitors all hurried up after him. It was quite a large party of people, and when you came to think of it, there were nine grown-ups and five children, fourteen in all. Nine plus five equals fourteen. They were pushing and shoving as they hustled and bustled down the passage, trying to keep up with the swift figure in front of them. Come on, cried Mr. Wonka. Get a move on, please. We'll never get around today if you don't like this. Soon he turned right off the main corridor and slightly onto a narrow passage. Then he turned left and left again and then right and then left and then right and then right and then left. The place was like a gigantic rabbit warren with passages leading him this way and that way in every direction. Don't let go of my hand, Charlie, whispered Grandpa Joe. Notice how all these passages are sloping downward, called Mr. Wonka. We are now going underground. All the most important rooms in my factory are deep down below the surface. Why is that? Somebody asked. There wouldn't be nearly enough space for them up on the top answered Mr. Wonka. These rooms we are going to are enormous. They are larger than football fields. No building in the world would be big enough to house all of them. But down here underneath the ground we've got all the space I want. There's no limit as long as I hollow it out. Mr. Wonka turned right. Then he turned left. He turned right again. The passages were sloping steeper and steeper downhill when suddenly Mr. Wonka stopped in front of him. There was a shiny metal door. The par party crowded around. On the door in large letters, it said, The Chocolate Room. Lucky for you, chapter 15 is called The Chocolate Room and we're going to continue. An important room this cried Mr. Wonka, taking a bunch of keys off his pocket and slipping one into the keyhole of the door. This is the nerve center of the whole factory, the whole heart of the whole business. And so beautiful, I insist on my rooms being beautiful. I can't abide ugliness in factories. In we go then, but do be careful, my dear children. Don't lose your heads. Don't get overexcited. Keep very calm. Mr. Wonka opened the door. Five children and nine grown-ups pushed their way in. And oh, what an amazing sight it was that now met their eyes. They were looking down upon a lovely valley. There were green meadows on each side of the valley and along the bottom, it flowed a great brown river. What is more, there was a tremendous waterfall halfway along the river and a steep cliff, cliff over which the water curled and rolled into a solid sheet and then went crashing down into the boiling churn of froth and spray. Below the waterfall 
And this was the most astonishing part of all. The whole mass of enormous glass pipes were dangling down into the river from somewhere high in the ceiling. They really were enormous, those pipes. They must have been a dozen of them at least. And they were sucking up the brownish muddy water from the river and carrying it away to goodness knows where. And because they were made of glass, you could see the liquid flowing and bubbling along inside them. And above the noise of the waterfall, you could hear the never ending suck, suck, sucking sound of the pipes as they did their work. Here's the pipe. I wonder what the brownish water is. Hmm. Graceful trees and brushes were growing all around the river banks, weeping willows and alders and tall trumps of trees and rhododendrons in their pink and red mauve blossoms. In the meadows, there were thousands of buttercups. There, cried Mr. Wonka, dancing up and down, pointing his gold top cane at the great brown river. It's all chocolate. Every drop of that river is hot melted chocolate, the finest quality, the very finest quality. There's enough chocolate there to fill every bathtub in the entire country and all the swimming pools as well. Isn't it terrific? And look at all my pipes. They suck up the chocolate and carry it away to all the other rooms in the factory where it's needed. Thousands of gallons an hour, my dear children. Thousands and thousands of gallons. The children and their parents were too flabbergasted to speak. They were staggered. They were dumbfounded. They were bewildered and dazzled. They were completely bowled over by the hugeness of the whole thing. They simply stood and stared. The waterfall is the most important, Mr. Wonka went on. It mixes the chocolate. It churns it up. It pounds it and beats it and makes it light and frothy. No other factory in the world mixes its chocolate by waterfall, but it's the only way to do it properly. The only way. And do you like my trees? He pointed out, pointing with his stick and my lovely bushes. Don't you think they look pretty? I told you I hated ugliness. And of course, they are all edible all made of something different and delicious. And do you like my meadow? Do you like my grass and my buttercups? Grass you are standing on, my dear little ones, are made of a new soft minty sugar that I've just invented. It's called Swidge. Try a blade. Please do it. It's delectable. Automatically, everybody bent down and picked a blade of grass. Everybody, that is, except Augustus Gloop, who took a big handful. And Violet Beauregard, before tasting her blade of grass, she took her piece of world-breaking world record breaking chewing gum out of her mouth and stuck it carefully behind her ear. Gross. Isn't it wonderful? cried Charlie. Hasn't it got a wonderful taste, Grandpa? I could eat the whole field, Grandpa Joe, grinning with delight. I could go around on all fours like a cow and eat every blade of grass in the field. Try a buttercup, cried Mr. Wonka. They're even nicer. Suddenly, the air was filled with screams of excitement. The screams came for, from Veruca Salt. She was pointing frantically to the other side of the river. Look, look over there, she screamed. What is it? He's moving. He's walking. It's a little person, a little man down there below the waterfall. Everybody stopped picking buttercups and stared across the river. She's right, Grandpa, cried Charlie. He is a little man. Can you see him? I see him, Charlie, said Grandpa Joe excitedly. And now everybody started shouting at once. There's two of them. My gosh, so there is. There's more than two. There's one, two, three, four, five. What are they doing? Where do they come from? Who are they? Children and parents alike rushed to the edge of the river to get a closer look. Aren't they fantastic? No higher than my knee. Look at their funny long hair. The tiny men, they were no larger than a medium-sized dolls, had stopped what they were doing, and now they were staring back across the river at their visitors. One of them pointed toward the children and whispered something to the other four, and all five of them burst into peals of laughter. But they can't be real people, Charlie said. Of course they're real people, Mr. Wonka answered. They are Oompa Loompas. Come back for chapter 16 called the Oompa Loompas. I love you.